Welcome to the biology section of our practice MCAT questions. In this video, we're going to be going through questions 101 to 105. So first I'll show you guys a question so that you can pause the video and attempt them on your own. Here's question 101, 102, 103, 104, and 105. Now let's go through the questions together. In question 101, it says gram-positive bacteria differ from gram-negative bacteria in that they blank. So how do gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria differ? You should know that both of these have a peptidoglycan layer, okay? But the main difference when regards to this, this thing, the peptidoglycan layer, when regards to this layer, the big difference is that gram-positive have a thicker layer. So positive... are thicker, this one is thinner. And we're talking about the peptidoglycan layer. You should also know the other differences between these two different strains of bacteria. But the main thing is when we're talking about staining, the peptidoglycan. And staining is usually how we figure out if something is gram positive or gram negative. So option A is saying that they do not contain any peptidoglycan. That's incorrect. Gram positive actually contain more than gram negative. B, that they're resistant to penicillin? No. These different strains don't make them resistant to antibiotics. It's more so other properties of their cell wall. It's more so the peptidoglycan layer and that it's thicker, but that doesn't necessarily make you immune to things like certain antibiotics. C, have two membranes with a thin peptidoglycan coat? No, that's actually gram negative. They're saying how to gram positive bacteria differ and it's actually gram negative which have two membranes the inner and the outer and they're the ones that have the thin peptidoglycan coat it's gram positive that has the thin the thick one gram negative is the one that's thin so c is describing gram negative therefore it's incorrect d is in, is correct they contain a thicker peptidoglycan coat so it's because of these coat or the peptidoglycan layer that they stain differently so for both of these, we can stain them first with a purple dye and then afterwards with a pink dye. The gram positive one, because of their thicker peptidoglycan layer, they hold this purple dye more strongly and then they're not stained with the other one and then they're just stained with the one that they were stained with first. So they show that color, that dye, the purple dye. They appear purple, gram positive, whereas gram negative, they don't hold that purple dye, they lose it and then they're stained with whatever they were secondly stained with, which is a pink dye, therefore gram negative appear pink. So keep in mind, gram positive has a thicker peptidoglycan coat, but they both have that layer. In question 102, it says the reaction takes place as follows. A goes to B, B is converted into C, and then an enzyme X catalyzes the A to B reaction, and enzyme Y catalyzes that second reaction, B to C. So X catalyzes this, Y catalyzes this. It is discovered that C interacts with enzyme X to increase its reaction rate. This can be referred to as what? So we're told that C comes back here, reacts with X, and then it actually increases the reaction. It makes more C being produced. So the key part is that C is interacting with enzyme X when a product of some reaction pathway is interacting with an upstream factor, so some other enzyme that's that's uh, catalyzing the reaction for some other reaction upstream in the pathway, that is called feedback. So first of all, we have feedback, and then feedback can be either positive or negative. If it's negative, that means that something at the end is going back and stopping the reaction at an earlier stage, that reaction pathway, because it's saying, okay, the whole purpose of this reaction pathway is to make more of me, the final product. Therefore, we don't need to keep making more of this because we have an, a suitable concentration. So let's go back and stop this overall reaction pathway and save resources. So that would be negative inhibition. Positive is when the final product actually says we need a higher concentration of me, the final product. Therefore, I'm gonna go back interact with something higher up in the reaction pathway to make it occur even more so, and even faster, and then lead to even more of that final product. So in this case, we're told that it increases the reaction rate of enzyme X 
Therefore, this is positive feedback. So D is our correct answer. B is incorrect. It's not negative feedback. A is saying allosteric inhibition. That's incorrect because of that inhibition part. It's actually activating the enzyme more. It's not inhibiting it. But the allosteric part is correct. So an enzyme has a main binding pocket for its intended substrate. Enzyme X, its intended substrate would be A that it's going to bind with and help catalyze it to it help it convert to product B. That's what its main binding substrate pocket is for. But then it has a, another pocket, an additional pocket. That's called the allosteric site. That's where C comes in binds. So it is allosteric. And C is saying kind of like the same thing. Non-competitive inhibition is when you're inhibited at a site that's not the main site. So you could have competitive inhibition. That's where the second thing that binds also binds to where the main substrate binds. So if it binds in the same pocket, but in this case, it's binding in another pocket because we're told it's bind with enzyme X and it increases its reaction rate, meaning that A can still get into the main binding pocket and be converted to B. So it is something that's, which is allosteric and also non-competitive, but it's not inhibition. Therefore, that's why both A and C are incorrect. In question 103, it says a human embryo that did not develop a mesoderm during gastrulation would result in early termination of the pregnancy. The embryo would be unable to form which of the following. So an embryo did not develop a mesoderm. Therefore, it's unable to develop which of the following. So first of all, we need to know what the mesoderm eventually becomes in terms of tissues in the the baby that's finally born and then therefore those things are not going to be able to be produced by this embryo so you should know that the endoderm the one that's all the way inside it's responsible for most of your internal tissues the sorry the internal organs whereas the mesoderm the middle one is responsible for internal tissues other than your organs so things like muscles and bones and then the ectoderm the one on the outside that one is responsible for things like your skin as well as your central nervous system, meaning your brain. So in this case, we're talking about the mesoderm. Nervous system, as I said, would be ectoderm, the outside one. Muscle tissue, that one would be mesoderm. So that's correct. C, skin, same thing would be the ectoderm, the outermost tissue layer. D, the digestive tract, this organ system would be developed by the endoderm. So what I just said briefly the main tissues that these three germ layers are responsible for, but there are others. So make sure you study up on that and know the detailed list of what the three tissue layers, three germ layers, what tissues they actually eventually lead to. But in this case, you should definitely know that mesoderm is responsible for muscle tissue and therefore one embryo that doesn't have a mesoderm cannot develop muscle tissue. In question 104, it says the F1 ATPase catalyzes the synthesis of ATP from ADP. Which of the following directly provides the necessary energy to drive the reaction? So this enzyme synthesizes ATP. So this is ATP synthase, which directly provides energy to drive the reaction. So what happens in the mitochondria, you have an inner layer and you have an outer membrane. So inner membrane and an outer membrane. In between them, you have this intermembrane space right here. So inter. This space between the inner and outer membranes of the mitochondria is an intermembrane space. You have some other enzymes which lead to H plus. So these protons or hydrogen ions moving to the intermembrane space. So I have a bunch of H plus floating around over here. And then I have another enzyme, which now allows those H plus to come back in to the inner side of the mitochondria, the mitochondrial matrix. So essentially what happens is you have some enzymes, which pumped out a lot of these hydrogen ions to the intermembrane space. They created a concentration gradient. There's a lot more of, it's a, an electrochemical gradient because it's based on the concentration as well as the charge. There's a lot of charge and a lot of concentration of hydrogen ions in the intermembrane space. 
and they want to flow down this gradient from the high concentration to low and come back inside the mitochondria, but they can't because of the membrane, they can't cross it because they're charged. But then this enzyme, the ATP synthase, allows them to come back in. So because it provides this, this doorway back in, they're going to follow this, they're going to come down their concentration gradient. The energy from this gradient is what's going to drive the ATP synthase to kind of rotate and then produce ATP from ADP and inorganic phosphate. So it's this gradient. That's the key thing. ATP synthesis is dependent on this gradient. So A is incorrect. It's not the movement of water. It's B. It's the movement of these hydrogen ions. When these hydrogen ions come back in, they react with oxygen. So you get hydrogen ion, and then they react with oxygen to give you water. This isn't fully balanced, but essentially what happens is they react with oxygen to give you molecules of water. But keep in mind, that's just a kind of a way of therefore doing something with the hydrogen ions afterwards when they come back in. When they come back into the, into the cell, you don't want these positively charged molecules just kind of floating around and they might react with something else. They might lead to some changes in the acidity of the environment inside the cell or lead to some other reaction, something like that. So therefore, they're kind of trapped and neutralized by reacting them with oxygen to make a neutral molecule water, which is harmless. So water is formed afterwards, but it's not any movement of water which drives anything. So it's not the movement of water, it's the movement of these protons along the concentration gradient. It's not the breakdown of carbon dioxide. The Krebs cycle does produce some carbon dioxide, but it's not really broken down. And that's not important for ATP synthesis. And finally, D, it's not the formation of water. It's not the formation. It's not like forming water is what's driving this ATP synthase. It's not like that's the, the main driver. We're talking about what directly provides the necessary energy. That would be actually the protons coming down their concentration gradient. They could have come in and reacted with something else to form some other product, but what really matters is that they come down to this concentration gradient. So movement of protons is the best answer. Moving on to question 105. In this question, it says the seeds of maple trees are known to whirl as they fall to the ground, much like a helicopter. Such an adaptation is favorable because it what? So if you've seen maple trees, you know that they're Seeds kind of look like this. Let's touch some seeds. All right, let's just leave that. Anyway, the seeds are attached to leaves, which look like this. And these rotate as they come down. So they twirl, kind of like they twirl or whirl, whatever the word is, kind of like a helicopter. And when they're coming down, this adaptation is favorable because of what? Why is it that this was chosen by evolution? Well, if they are whirling, that means that they don't just drop. Other trees that have seeds that are in a heavier vessel, like it could be an acorn, it could be some apple, something like that. Either way, those are heavier. They fall down and they're likely to fall down near the tree. But what you want is for your seeds to be dispersed because the more dispersed they are, the more area the tree has eventually when it begins to grow to you know grow into to reach into for its branches to stretch into for its roots to stretch into it has more nutrients it's not sharing them with the main parent that it was derived from it has availability to nutrients and open air so that is why you want to disperse your seeds for their health and so if these seeds are twirling for a longer time instead of just falling straight down they have a longer time that they're in the air which can allow things like wind to push them and guide them further away from the tree which they originated. So A thing increases the area a single tree can disperse to. Yes, this is true. B, it gives the seed less time to hit the ground. No, it gives them more time because they're in the air for longer because they're, they're twirling in the air as they fall. C, allows for a higher mutation rate in seed production, allowing for a higher variability. No, it is correct that a higher mutation rate and a higher variability in, an, in a population is you know good for it. Not too high a mutation rate, but like enough that there is variability is good, but this does not 
it, it doesn't it's not clear and it doesn't really make sense how this kind of twirling of the leaves that are attached to the seed would lead to mutations arising so that doesn't make sense it's more so physically what happens is that they spend more time in the air and therefore they can be dispersed further so a is correct d saying none of the above no that's incorrect a is actually an answer which is correct and makes sense so a is the correct answer for question 105 and that's it for the questions in this video if you enjoy, if you enjoyed what you saw make sure to check out our course the link is right here also in the description and other than that, make sure to subscribe to this channel here to stay up to date with the videos that we post here. That's it.